Welcome to this podcast uh, from Concordia Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Charles Gieschen, and speaking to you today about the gospel lesson for Pentecost 22, Series A, which is Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 to 12. Now, some of you are celebrating All Saints. Uh, certainly, there's Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, that is a text that's used for that festival. We do have uh, certainly a podcast on that done previously. You can look it up in our media site. Today, I'm actually doing the pod, a podcast on the Gospel lesson for Pentecost 22, uh, which is Matthew 23. Uh, and it could be used to preach uh, to an All Saints Day because of the kind of um, condemnation of outward um, acts of piety, uh, but rather a, a focus on those who God exalts, those who are humble. That actually, the text, namely Matthew 23, 1 to 12, could be used to and, and work the All Saints theme into a sermon preached from it. Uh, as we look at Matthew 23, 1 to 12, I just have, uh, I would like to read for you a section from Deuteronomy. It mentions phylacteries uh, in the text, which is certainly part of the outward piety of first century Jews, which was a literal uh, acting out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And uh, this is a very famous section of Deuteronomy. It's been alluded to in our text because it mentions phylacteries. And it's uh, from this section, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them. This is verse 8. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And uh, you shall write them on the doorpost of your heart and on your gates. This emphasis on the frontlets before your eyes, Jews took this rather literally of writing the Torah on little um, scraps, little um, pieces of um, paper and putting them in leather pouches to hang right in front of their eyes. So that's the reference. It's a rather literal and again, sometimes this would be seen as a very outward sign of their piety. They're taking seriously uh, the law of God. And you can see how Jesus is criticizing outward piety where there is not inward faith and trust, especially in the Messiah who has come, God who has come in the flesh. So that passage helps give us some background to that reference of some of the outward, quote, acts of piety that we see mentioned by Jesus or criticized by Jesus in our text. Let's now um, move to the text, namely to uh, our board, Matthew 23, 1 to 12. And we begin with the setting for this, and this actually, after verse 12, you have Jesus getting into a very strong prophetic condemnation, the so-called woes of Matthew 23, very much resembling some of the prophets and their condemnation of Israel. Jesus is the, the uh, final and great prophet after John the Baptist, uh, and it's very, this is probably one of the strongest chapters of condemnation of unbelieving Jews that is found in the, all of the Gospel of Matthew. But in these 12 verses leading up to it, it certainly, um, before the actual woes, Jesus does confront some of the false piety of the Jews. And so here, verse 1 uh, gives us the setting. Then Jesus, he, he spoke, who was he speaking to? The crowds and the disciples. So here's his audience. Certainly it was made up of his, um, of his followers, but also the wider crowds. So he is speaking to Jews, including Jews that were not believing in him, probably Pharisees and scribes, because he mentions them here, are among the crowds. And then uh, you have the participle. I have the verbs in green, participles in purple. He was saying, and uh, here you have your, your subject in the nominative, the scribes, and also the Pharisees. Those are the people who are doing what? They are sitting 
upon the seed of Moses. And again, the seed of Moses is an image of, of the one who teaches the law. So these are the teachers of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees. They pride themselves in being the ones who impart uh, what Moses has given us in terms of the revelation God gave to Moses to give to the people. And then you have this uh, next section where you have Jesus contrasting uh, what they are um, uh, asking people to do with what they themselves are actually doing, namely the scribes and the Pharisees. He actually says here, here's your, your, your verbs, the imperatives, namely to do, that uh, do, and then also keep. It's interesting, this is a present imperative, probably implying uh, the, uh, the policy type of command, namely continually keep. So do and continually keep from terao, it's an e eo contract verb, uh, all whatsoever um, that they tell to you. So if they're teaching the law, Jesus is basically saying, do what they are saying and continually keep what they are saying. And then he contrasts that with, but do not do, notice the negation here with the, uh, uh, with the um, uh, imperative, do not do uh, according to their works, namely, do what they're saying, not what they are doing. Um, in the sense of the teaching, the, the, the law of God, obey that, follow that, continually uh, keep that, but watch what they don't, do not do what they are doing. And he's here going to criticize some of their outward piety, and, uh, and that's uh, what he's saying, do not follow or do that. Um, and here then he, in the, the rest of the verse, specifies, uh, at the end of verse 3, specifies that they, um, that they are saying things, right, here's your verb, uh, and they are not doing them. So they are speaking things from the law, but they themselves are not carrying those things out. They might do some things of outward piety, but they are not actually um, concerned with the heart and doing that which is the will of God. So he's criticizing that, and here's an example of what they are, are trying to do with people. Uh, here, verse 4, you have the verb. They are um, tying, right here, they are tying heavy burdens. So here's heavy burdens. They are tying that which are difficult to bear. So these are the kinds of things that they are, are doing. They are uh, setting up, one might say, additional laws beyond the, the uh, teaching of Moses. And they are, are putting those heavy burdens, tying those heavy burdens upon people. And they are placing them, here's your verb, they are placing them upon the, the backs of people. So they are what we would say in light of the Reformation, they are burdening people with the demands of the law, as if, that's, as if people can do that as a way of appeasing God. And Jesus is criticizing that kind of understanding of the law. We should teach the law as something to glorify God, but not that somehow we can actually accomplish all of that, and that's how we have a righteous status before God. First and foremost is faith. What does Jesus say John 6, 29, when they ask, what are we to be doing, to be doing the works of God? Jesus says, the work of God is this, to believe in him whom he has sent. And then Jesus uh, criticizes, as he continues, the end of verse 4, he criticizes what they're saying. He's saying, but uh, they themselves um, desire um, to move with their finger, not them. So what he's saying is, they put this burden on others, but they themselves, here you have the intensifier for the personal pronoun, they themselves are not desiring to move them with even 
their finger. Okay? Uh, so the contrast is laying these heavy burdens on others, and yet they themselves are not um, taking these things and doing them, them uh, themselves. Verse 5 uh, continues the criticism that Jesus uh, wages against them. He said, they do all their deeds, right here, uh, here's the uh, verb, they are doing all of their works or deeds, proston, um, uh, and then you have the infinitive, that's uh, the articular infinitive expressing purpose, in order to be seen or to be beheld by people. So why are they doing these things? Not from the heart to please God, but in order to be recognized by others, uh, in order to get the acclaim of others. They do it for the honor of men rather than to honor and glorify God. And then uh, Jesus goes on in the second half of that, that verse, um, for they make, and now this is the reference to, um, to uh, uh, phylacteries uh, here, they, they make broad right here, namely they make them very wide, very visible, uh, the phylacteries, which are the little leather pouches that contain the Torah uh, over the eyes. Uh, they make broad their phylacteries and then you have this mention of the, um, the fringes and the fringes right here they make long, right here. Uh, so what they're talking about here are the outward ornaments of their dress that show their outward piety, namely the fringes on their prayer shawl and the ph phylacteries hanging um, from, their, from their head, from their hair. And so you have then this kind of criticism of the outward piety of some of the first century Jews by Jesus. He goes on and he says, verse 6, they are loving, here again criticizing uh, some of the outward piety of these Jews, they are loving the, um, this is a reference to the place, the first or the place of honor in the feast, so this would be the honored place at the table. And this is what these Jews are looking for, uh, the place of honor. And then also, in a similar way, uh, the first seat of the synagogue, namely the pr most prominent seat at the synagogue. You might say uh, it's that special uh, pew in the church that everybody wants to sit in. Uh, that's what, these, um, what they were looking for, the, the seat of honor at feast and at the synagogue. Uh, then it goes on in verse 7, what else are they looking for? And the greetings, right here, uh, aspasmus, the greetings in the marketplaces, right here. So they're looking for people to see them with their outward uh, piety, their prayer shawl, their phylacteries, and then to greet them. And then they also <clears throat> are uh, looking at... Um, uh, what they like to have happen is to be called, right here the infinitive verb, to be called by men rabbi. So they want to have that honorable um, uh, title offered to them, that they are the rabbi, they are the teachers. Uh, remember here Jesus is uh, criticizing them for not properly teaching, but they love the title teacher. Uh, and then he says, you are not to call, notice then the negating um, uh, M, uh, where you have may plus the uh, error subjunctive. He's saying, don't in the future call um, them rabbi. So you don't, uh, Jesus is arguing against this. Why does he say that? He gives them the reason then uh, in verse, uh, the rest of this verse, for there is one, there is the numeral one, there is one um, teacher of yours, or your teacher is one, uh, and then he has the explanation to that, and you, for you are all brothers. Namely, don't put one teacher uh, over the other, you are all brothers, 
and the emphasis is actually we have a key teacher, and that's Jesus. He'll explain that in the next verse. Verse, or actually, yeah, verse 9. Uh, and then verse 9, uh, he talks about the fact of the honoring of people who are father. He says, and call, do not call, may plus the era subjunctive again, this negative command, do not call fa your father anyone upon earth, um, for your father in the heavens is your one father. So again, the contrast of recognizing that we don't honor other people, we honor God first and foremost, and he is, our, he is the one whom we bestow the ultimate title of father on. Now, it doesn't mean we can't call earthly fathers father, but we give that honor to, um, to God above all others. And that's what Jesus is emphasizing him, is the one who is the Father in the heavens. Jesus uses this kind of language about uh, the Father in the Lord's Prayer. Here it comes up again in the end of the Gospel. And then verse 10 gets back to this topic of who is the rabbi, who is the teacher. And he says in verse 10, again, this language of uh, do not call um, or neither call. Uh, you have that may plus the era subjunctive negative command. Do not call um, people instructors or, or another title for the one who sits to teach. But, but um, Christ is your sitting instructor right here. So this fits in nicely is why do we not call other people rabbis? these other Jews, because finally Christ is our key instructor or teacher. Uh, and that's very clearly the Christ. And that's a reference to, obviously, his own title the, as the Messiah. Uh, and then verse 11 continues on with this superlative adjective. The one who is greatest of you or among you is what? Your servant. Now, this is a beautiful section that could be brought out if you're preaching this text on all saints, is where do we see the life of the saints? We see it lived out not in this kind of false piety, but in true piety, namely in di diakonos, namely are the, as servants. Uh, so the one who is greatest um, your, among you is your, is your servant. And obviously, Jesus lived this out himself. He humbled himself. God exalted him. He humbled himself unto death. We see in he who was the servant of all, the one who is greatest of all. And we see that as the example for all saints who, uh, who uh, live out as they follow Christ a life of servanthood, a life of service to one another. Uh, and that's, that is what uh, draws honor and glory to God rather than outward uh, signs of piety such as he mentioned with the Jews. And then finally, right at this close, verse 12, you have uh, whoever, right here, whoever exalts himself. And this is what Jesus is referring to in some of the Jewish piety up in verses 5, 6, and 7. Whoever exalts himself uh, and then you have this perfect tense verb, will be humbled. Maybe you could even translate this one, humiliated, in the sense of uh, this is an eschatological judgment theme of God humbling or humiliating those who exalt themselves. And then the opposite, the, the blessed gospel close to this uh, uh, pericope, whoever humbles himself uh, will be exalted, and here you have again that aorist passive, and here we can call it a divine passive in the sense God will exalt him. God's the actor for this passive verb activity. So just to, a few words to close. You can see from this text that while it does contain uh, a lot of condemnation of outward piety, from it we can see what God is encouraging, what Jesus is encouraging through his teaching here, namely to humble oneself 
to act in service to others. And finally, that is what God's going to exalt. That's what God brings honor and glory to God, rather than some of this false piety that uh, the Jews, and especially the burdening of, of, of others with the law, and then they themselves not teaching what they, what, or not living what they were teaching. Uh, so, for all saints, if I preach this on all saints, I would emphasize especially this closing uh, verse, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted, namely, God will exalt him, just like the Father exalted the Son, so um, uh, the Son will exalt those whom, uh, who trust in him and follow in that way of service, loving him, uh, loving God first with all their heart and loving their neighbor as themselves. May the Lord bless your proclamation of this text uh, in, in the Sunday ahead.